Gloria Ferris, the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society uh, board member, and I'm here with Katie Fallon, our author of the month, who uh, shared Vulture, the uh, private life of an unlived bird with us last week, and we invited her to come to our discussion about your favorite nature book, and she said that if she could be here, she would be here, and she came, and we have a few other members of Western Cuyahoga with us, and we have our uh, webmaster, uh, Betsy O'Hagan, with us, and she'll be uh, helping with me with the slides and things. So uh, let's get started. Um, Katie has children, and so she has given us some of her Sunday night, and some of the rest of us on this call also have children, and uh, bedtime is not too far away. So Katie, thanks so much for coming back and uh, talking with us about uh, your favorite nature book. I'm kind of thinking you may have more than one, and um, since you're our featured guest, that is all well and good. You may share whatever you would like. So uh, we usually ask people to uh, share the book, tell a little bit about uh, what it means to them, why it is one of their favorite, and um, maybe how long it's been a favorite, or if it's a new one, and the uh, floor is yours. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Gloria and Betsy. Uh, thank you for having me today um, to uh, talk about the books. Um, I have, of course, uh, a stack of books over here. Uh, so I tried to bring a couple books that um, I won't talk too much about all of them, but maybe I'll just talk about one, but I'll show you other ones. So, so the. <laughs> One book that I'm reading right now that I'm really enjoying, but I'm, I'm only this far, which is actually pretty far, um, I read like three pages a day, um, is called Our Wild Calling by Richard Louvre. And he is the person who wrote um, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. So he writes a lot of sort of um, psycho psychological kind of uh, work about connecting people and children with nature. Uh, and this one is, in particular, is about um, connecting people with animals. And the subtitle, How Connecting with Animals Can Transform Our Lives and Save Theirs. And it's, uh, I try to connect with animals, well, I do connect with animals, like, all, a lot. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a really, it's a really great, great book so far. Um, if you, if you like animals and if you want to think about um, human-animal interactions, um, it can be a good one, um, a really good one to check out. And I have, I have a favorite, um, a favorite paragraph that that I have to. Oh no, I should have. Where did it go? I have a favorite, a favorite paragraph that I'll read about animals and children. The right animal can give a child a deeper capacity for wonder and empathy, as well as a set of symbols to help make sense of the world. We are more than walking genetic code. We are biological poems, and so are the creatures around us. We do not create the code or language, but we do make meaning out of it. We write the first lines of that poem as children. Our companion animals humanize us. They can offer unconditional love and show us how to give it. They give us the gift of shared imperfections, the seed of sympathy and humor. They join our pack, or we join theirs. They and we co-become. We are not alone. Uh, and I think that's just really, uh, really wonderful. Um, okay, so that was like one minute, right? Two minutes. Uh, one, one, of my, one of my old favorites is Ecology of a Cracker Childhood by Janice Ray. Um, if you're interested at all in the southern Georgia longleaf pine ecosystem, um, you should check this book out. It came out in the 90s, maybe, the 1990s. Um, Janice Ray is a really cool um, Georgia writer. If you like uh, longleaf pines, are a weird, amazing ecosystem. They have to burn in order to reproduce. Um, the heat from the fire opens 
um, the pine cones of the longleaf pine. Uh, so it's like they have to have, they're like a fire uh, maintained ecosystem. Um, animals like the red cockaded woodpecker, gopher tortoise, um, a lot of others live there. About So this is a memoir of her childhood, but it's set in the longleaf pine ecosystem. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and this one is a book that was badly damaged <laughs> because I um, I took it camping and it rained. This is like the story of my life. Um, I get a new book, I take it camping, and then it rains on I had to repair it um, a bunch of times. But the author says that um, he likes to see that it's been well-loved. So, so I, I sent him a picture of it. But it's called um, The Home Place um, by J. Drew Lanham. And it came out recently, maybe only two or three years ago. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, Betsy's nodding that maybe she has heard of it. Um, it's a great book. It's another memoir um, uh, about the intersections of uh, identity and race and um, nature and birds. Um, you know how what it means, what it can mean to be um, a black man who loves birds and nature. Uh, and it's it's um, another southern book. Uh, it's a it's a it's a really great one. Um, he's a really beautiful writer. Um, writes beautifully about birds, uh, which I appreciate a lot. <laughs> Okay, and finally, um, finally, this is um, this book is uh, also a new book called Saving Jemima by an Ohio author, um, Julie Zikafus. Hopefully, you all know Julie Zikafus, right? Um, and Saving Jemima: Life and Love with a Hard Luck J. So Julie is also a wildlife rehabilitator, and she does primarily songbirds, and she. Uh, has an affinity. She likes baby songbirds. So Jemima is um, a young uh, jay that she takes in um, and raises and is able to uh, release back in the wild. And this is the story of um, saving Jemima. And it's a really neat book. I learned a lot about blue jays reading it. I thought I knew stuff about blue jays, but not really. Um, uh, you can tell blue jays apart by studying their markings on their faces and on their, um, and I didn't really know that before. And Julie, um, the back of the book has pages that you can tear out. And you can actually, you can make photocopies of these pages if you don't want to tear them out. And you can draw, you can look at the Blue Jays at your feeder and try to draw them to distinguish them. Um, in addition to just the, the story itself, she's got a lot of photographs. Um, of Jemima and other Blue Jays, uh, and she's got artwork too um, because she's also a fabulous artist. And there's a lot of um, a lot of personal stuff in here also um, that I always there's some of her artwork. Um, I always uh, appreciate like personal stuff. Like maybe I'm nosy, uh, but I like to to hear about um, people's personal lives, what they're doing um, when they are uh, writing and observing birds. So um, if you like art and Blue Jays uh, and Blue Jay Rehab, I mean, this can be a really, this can be a really great book to check out. Um, and Julie Zikafus is just a, a really nice person, too. Um, if you haven't had her come and do anything um, or if you haven't seen her give a, give a book talk or a bird talk, she's, she's very, very cool. Okay. So that's my, that's my, my quick overview of four books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was, uh, you You share so lovingly. I, I really appreciate you. You're, you're so giving uh, with what you know and and what you, you know, what you like and, and you think, you know, what all of those books, what I'm sure if Betsy doesn't already have them on our reading list, what are our, our book lists for people suggestions we'll put them on and I know that we have uh, Saving Jemima because Julie gave us uh, was it one copy or two copies of her book for one of our silent auctions for um, a fundraiser that we had so we are aware of that book and it is a very very lovely book you are you are correct um, she she her artwork is uh, really an added uh, value to her books and uh, so I think my question to you Katie is that um, do you have an another book that you're thinking about writing um, 
in regard to maybe your rehabilitation work or another bird that you really have liked or uh, what would you, uh, what's your, what's in that head of yours? <laughs> what's next? Well, I, um, uh, well, there are a few books that um, I'm, I'm hoping to write. Uh, it's just going very slowly at the moment. Um, but my, I'm, I've been mostly working on a book about horses, uh, which is a little bit of a um, breakaway from birds. But it's not that far a breakaway, actually. Uh, um, I adopted a couple horses a few years ago. Um, and it's been a, just a pretty interesting experience. And I grew up with horses. Um, so I've been trying to write about that, but it's, uh, it's just going very slowly with the whole everything else in life. <laughs> well, you have a lot going on. So I would say that writing may be the fourth or fifth priority and not, not the first, given, given all that you do. Like yeah. all the priorities are first. I feel like it's sort of, it's like whack-a-mole. Like I just oh, sort of, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of I don't know. Like, Sometimes maybe that's not the best way to do it with everybody. Everything's a first priority. No. <laughs> no. Um, do you, would you like to talk about your children's books a little bit? Uh, just give us a little uh, look at the farm and look at the, what's yeah. the other one? Oh, why can't I remember that one? Look, well, see the farm, and look, see the birds. The birds. Why did I think of that? Sure. Uh, Sorry. Well, that's okay. Um, well, look, see the so uh, the children's books are I I co-authored them with Bill Wilson. Um, Bill Wilson is the founder of Birds and Beans Coffee, uh, which is a really great um, shade grown. Uh, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center bird friendly coffee. Um, you should, if it's very, very good in addition to being triple certified as bird friendly, USDA organic, and fair trade. Um, so, uh, um, Bill uh, is a, f a friend of mine, and I got to know him after writing my book about cerulean warblers. Uh, and he Cerulean warblers are, of course, a bird that might spend the winter in shade-grown coffee plantations um, in the tropics. And Bill said, uh, I have an idea for a children's book, but I don't think I can uh, write it. I just, I have, if I give you my idea um, and I find an illustrator, can you write the words? <laughs> and I said, um, I said, I can try, but I don't know. Uh, I don't really write books for ch stuff for children very often um, or ever. <laughs> So he gave me his idea, and it's it's a book about it's kids on a coffee farm in Nicaragua, uh, which is where some of Birds and Beans coffee comes from. Um, and I think it's I get the impression it's kind of Bill's uh, favorite sort of place to get get their coffee from for Birds and Beans. Um, it's about kids on a coffee farm in Nicaragua and all the birds they see on their coffee farm, and then um, then the birds all birds all leave in the spring. Uh, or a lot of the birds leave, and then kids in North America see the same birds. So it's it's uh, it starts off Nicaragua and then goes to um, Texas and uh, New York City, uh, West Virginia, of course, um, Ontario, um, and uh, um, Whidbey Island in the in the Northwest. Um, so it's a uh, uh, it was a fun book to write about bird migration, and then all the different kids see the birds, and then at the end of the book, they all go back to the same farm in Nicaragua. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a really great uh, holiday gift for a child, for a kid. That would be really very interesting. That's a, that sounds like a sounds like an idea. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's got a lot of the illustrator. Uh, Leanne Carter is the illustrator, um, an artist out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and she did uh, beautiful, beautiful original um, artwork for it. And the other book, Look, See the Farm, is somewhat similar in that uh, it's about all the birds that might benefit from an organic dairy farm. So it's um, uh, one of the things about um, 
the organic coffee, the shade-grown coffee, are a lot of the birds that can live on these shade-grown coffee farms can migrate back to North America and live somewhere like an organic, an organic farm in the U.S. So there's really a connection between the organic farmers of the Americas. So um, uh, the illustrator, Leanne, and I visited a uh, organic dairy farm in uh, North Carolina, in a, near Elon, North Carolina, a beautiful organic dairy farm. It's um, one of the, or, they uh, are part of the Organic Valley um, Co-op. Uh, and just there are so many birds um, on this dairy farm. It was crazy. And they have a lot of, you know, the, they leave a lot of the grass. Um, they do things to protect the water. They don't use pesticides. They have organic chickens or chickens, you know, with organic eggs. They have a feed store where they sell organic feed that they grow on the farm and some other, other parts of the farm. It was really amazing. We saw a lot of birds. So that book is about um, two sisters that visit their grandparents who own an organic dairy farm and they walk around on all the different birds they see in different seasons. Um, and they see a uh, wood thrush and uh, meadowlark, um, uh, barn swallows, uh, bobwhite, uh, which are all birds that, that Leanne and I saw when we were there. Um, at the very end, they see a screech owl, uh, which is a... Uh, Those anyway, books so sound really, really good. I think I'm going to have to put them on the list for the girls for uh, Christmas. They sound like really, really great uh, additions to my little shopping list for, the, for my granddaughters. So... Um, Maybe next, uh, if you have, have a bit more time, um, Betsy, we have a slide about the wish list of uh, Avian Center, uh, Conservation Center of Appalachian, Appalachia. Um, it's located in Morgantown, West Virginia. I've already learned some of these things. and. It rehabilitates injured birds from Maryland and Pennsylvania and West Virginia. It's kind of Morgantown is right in close to the center of that. So that's where they are. And um, Katie did a wonderful program for us on Friday, uh, October 21st, and gave us a tour of the facility. And we met Cheryl and American Crow and Lou and Doris was Doris. it. That was their names, the turkey buzzards. And Maverick was the black vulture. And boy, he was, uh, he or she was really, he played with toys, he ate for us, he did all sorts of things. So it's a really very interesting thing um, to take a look at. It's on our website. Uh, oh no, it's on our YouTube channel. So um, look look that up and take a look. See, uh, did you have a list of some of the things that Katie needs for uh, the uh, center? I know that uh, they love mealworms and waxworms, and you can actually go on Amazon.com. I believe, or send a uh, donation directly to Katie's. Uh, it's Katie and her husband and friends of theirs who have uh, started this aviation center, and they uh, usually have 30 to 40 volunteers who help them with feeding and keeping cages clean and and helping the um, birds get ready to uh, fly on their own again and be out in the wild. But with COVID-19, they've been very uh, kind of hurt, hit hard with the topsy-turvy world we're all in. And uh, those birds still need the same amount of food, uh, but they're donations are a bit down so there are a lot of things that you can do trash bags uh, exam gloves they have need paper towels and then the food they like I said they uh, enjoy wheel mealworms and wax worms and um, wild birds unlimited um, 
and we have them listed on our website as well. Uh, if you notify them, they will send a gift card to uh, AVA, Avian Conservation Center, um, the ACCA of West Virginia, if if you should ask them. So, so anyway, um, I really stress looking at that YouTube recording that we have of that live interview with Katie. It was really, I was lucky enough to uh, get there just in time as it started and I couldn't look away. It was really, really wonderful. It was a good time. So anyway, um, Katie, uh, I invite you to stay and listen to uh, the others. Um, I'm going to ask uh, is Drina back with us? Yes. Good. Drina, uh, would you like to go first this, this week? Sure. Uh, last month, I think Michelle went uh, first sure. after our featured uh, person. So how about you? Okay. What do you have to share to, today? Well, um, I for this book club, I finished a book that I had started earlier in the year, and uh, since I had forgotten quite a bit of it, I went back and reread the first five chapters. But it's called uh, Lost Among the Birds by Neil Hayward. And it's about his story of becoming um, the champion for a uh, number of birds seen in the United States and Canada, uh, according to American Birding Association standards. And it's uh, entitled Lost Among the Birds because it's also the story of what was going through his life personally um, as he approached that monumental year of 40. And uh, there were quite a few major changes in his life uh, that he started through during this year. And it's divided into 12 chapters uh, that basically go with each month. So that you can, he tracks uh, all the birds that he's seen each month, and he also keeps a running list at the in the uh, appendix. Uh, it's a really a delightful book. He loves birds. He grew up in England and had uh, a great interest in birds when he was younger, and um, continued that through uh, his education and um, training and um, some, in some very interesting things about the book are that, uh, of course, all the birds that he sees over the course of this year and he gets up to, um, let's see, I hope I'm getting this right, exactly right. He gets 747 birds plus three provisional, meaning that uh, they weren't in the American Birding Association list, but uh, two of those were accepted and the third one wasn't. But the, those three birds uh, got him over the record that was set in uh, 1998 by Sandy Comito, who the, the uh, movie and the book, The Big Year, The Biggest Year, uh, so he broke his record, and he did this in 2013. Um, one thing I so enjoyed about it was uh, now with the internet, so uh, being able to look up these birds and see what they look like, and then uh, as I was reading about St. Paul's Island in, um, off of the coast of Alaska, I was able to, you know, get a video of St. Paul's Island and take a tour with the drone, and it was fabulous to see the island. And then, coincidentally, I found another video that happened to be put together by one of the tour companies that Neil used. And so he talks about different people in the book, too, and all the things that they do as tour guides. So it was really fun, you know, to get to see and hear these these uh, tour guides uh, after having read about them in the book. 
And so um, really the internet was my constant companion with this, uh, with this book so that I could really see, um, see the birds too. So it was a great experience uh, reading this book and I, I just finished it this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Gave you incentive to yes. read it to the end, right? Definitely, yes. Um, is Neil still based in England? And was this Lost with Birds, uh, the, uh, was it kind of a quest that he went around the United States looking for birds? Or what, what well, was his incentive for doing this? He was, uh, he found that birding was um, his activity that helped him through a depression. And he didn't really recognize that he was depressed until um, a few months into 2013 when he sought some help and was able to be steered in the right direction and started on an antidepressant. And so you kind of see as the year goes on that he, is feeling better. He did not know at the beginning of the year that he was going to make it a big year. But by April, he makes a decision because he's also struggling with commitment with in a relationship. And he finds that if he goes off and looks for birds, it, it helps him to not feel so pressured into a relationship. And so he's sorting out commitment during this year too. Um, so uh, it, it, it's a, you know, a personal growth story. Uh, he's, he lives in the Boston area now. And during this, as he wrote this book, he was struggling because he had left uh, his previous job, which was just way too high stress for him. Um, but apparently he was able to he was able to support himself this whole year, and he covered 250,000 miles that year. He went to 28 states, six provinces, 56 airports, 195 days away from home, um, and uh, 55 rental cars. He wow. went to Alaska eight times that year. Wow. Yeah, that's, so um, that's a lot of miles. <laughs> he, did, he doesn't say in the epilogue like what happened with his work, uh, what he did, but he did write this book, and, and perhaps this book then has become, you know, kind of his another, you know, vocation. But it was, it's wonderful reading, and then again, for all of us who love birds, lots of, uh, lots of birds to hear about. You know, this is about the um, third time this week I've heard about birding helping people through a time that they were depressed. Mm -hmm. And I find that um, very interesting. And then I read an article uh, recently, I think it was an excerpt from an article that I read in the week. Um, saying that um, it's a great coping method, getting out, looking up, as we always say, and uh, watching birds or just sitting in the middle of an area where you can, can focus on birds is very helpful with your mental health. And actually, the author of this article was a uh, mental health professional and was telling people that um, just getting out and sitting alone and, and being in nature is very, very helpful for your mental health during this time, these really challenging times that we're having with COVID-19 that now certainly don't seem like they're going to be going away anytime soon since so many areas in the nation and the world are doing an uptick again. So um, that's a very interesting um, thing, Drina, that you uh, picked this memoir from a man who was, you know, struggling with a high-stress job and what was he going to do? He didn't want to 
didn't know whether he wanted to commit to a, a relationship or not. And so where did he find a way to, to get away and to kind of wash the cobwebs out and, and get kind of a renewal um, through birds, through his love of birds and the travel that he did. And mm -hmm. it sounds like a really good, what was the name of the book again, just uh, so we can be sure to make sure that people know. Lost Among the Birds by Neil Hayward. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Drina. So any poetry this week or not this week? I'm going to save <laughs> that for next week with David sure. Lindo? Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Okay. Um, well, um, let's go with Michelle, and then we'll talk about David a little bit for next month, our author of the moment uh, next month. Michelle, it is now your turn. My turn. All right. Uh, well, first, before I dive into my book, I want to share um, a very short but funny story. Um, and it, occur it, it concerns the ACCA. Um, so earlier this year, a friend of mine uh, had a birthday and on Facebook, she said, donate to this you know, bird organization. They need all sorts of worms and whatnot, and here's their, their Amazon wish list. I'm like, okay. And I, I sent a, a package of mealworms and um, said happy birthday to my friend, and that was like months ago. And then just today, my, hus my husband and I share an Amazon Prime account. He's like, why are mealworms in our buy again list? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, because we don't raise birds or anything, so he's really confused. And I'm like, you know, I, my friend wanted me to send it to the organization for her birthday. I'm like, what was the organization? And he looked and he's like, oh, it's the Avian Conservation Center for Appalachia. And I'm like, I know what that is now. <laughs> so this was, you know, before I read your book, Katie, and I really hadn't heard of your organization. So it was really fun to make that connection. Great, well, anyway, I just had to share. Thank you, thank you for the word. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you're welcome. All right, so my book that I'm sharing is um, The Sun is a Compass, um, and it's by Carolyn, or Caroline Van Hemert. Uh, it's The Sun is a Compass, a 4,000-mile journey into the Alaskan wilds. Um, back in 2012, her and her husband uh, hiked and rode and, uh, you know, however else they could get through the Alaskan wilds. And I just want to pull up here the map of their journey. So they started in Bellingham, uh, Washington, and they rode um, all the way to Yukon. So it's, it's really far. I don't know if you could see it. I know there's a glare. Um, and then they hiked and pack rafted all the way to the Arctic Circle uh, and then headed west through the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and um, some other parks and preserves uh, all the way to, I'm probably going to butcher that all, all these um, cities have, you know, native names, uh, Co Kotzebue, I don't know, it's, it's a city on the, on the west of Alaska. And it was 4,000 miles and took them six months to travel um, all that way just with their own human power, you know, hiking, rowing, rafting, whatnot. And they stopped several times to um, to resupply. So they went like city to city, village to village. Uh, so they weren't, you know, hauling all their supplies with them. And they, you know, would they knew that they would need their raft for a while, so they would mail it to the location where they would need it. So they had some, you know, creative ways to to keep their load as light as possible. Uh, but still, it just, when I bought this book, and I did just finish it today as well <laughs> for this, um, uh, when I bought this book, it was on a list, and I, I also go hiking, so I think it was like in some sort of nature or hiking Facebook group that I follow, and I had no idea, but uh, Caroline is an ornithologist. So when I started reading this book, I, I'm noticing it's a full of like birds. Like she keeps talking about birds, and then I realize that oh, she's going to school. She's doing field research on birds, and she's uh, so it was a really kind of a fun way to to discover that. Um, uh, so yeah, this book is great for 
an Audubon conversation because it's it's full of birds and uh, she talks about their my, the migrations of different species and their behavior and how what she's seen relates to the journey that she's on uh, with her and her husband. And I do just want to read, I did pick out a few paragraphs here. Um, so this is when they finally reach the Arctic Circle. It's just, I don't know how long it's going to take me. I have, I have time, right? Yeah. All right. In the early evening, we finally reached the end of land, where a low sod bank folds into the silty water of the Arctic Ocean. The difference between here and the Mackenzie Delta from a day ago is staggering. The coastal breeze keeps the mosquitoes at bay. Without head nets blocking our vision, we can see again. Without bugs hovering around our noses and mouths, we can breathe. At our feet is a carpet of tiny pink saxifrage flowers. Above us, the sky opens into a million shades of blue. We notice a string of white dots on the horizon, and as we draw near, the specks become swans, floating serenely in the still water. I spin in place, scanning with my binoculars, and begin to count. Ten, twenty, sixty swans scattered across the flats. Uh, phalaropes swim circles in the small ponds, while dow dowichers probe a sewing machine-like along their margins. A Lapland long spur chortles sweet notes as a sandhill crane walks past with lurching, exaggerated steps parading its prehistoric grace. This is the Arctic I had imagined. We continue to hike across the tundra for several hours, heading west as we parallel the coast rather than the river. From the air, this landscape resembles a strangely mowed golf course, pale green polygons as far as the eye can see. Permafrost creates this montage. Ice wedges intrude into the soil, gradually increasing with each cycle of freeze and thaw. Miniature drainage canals are formed, and these eventually give way to ponds and sloughs. sloughs. The wet ground is covered with tussocks, the massive above-ground root system of Arabiforum cotton grass. Um, it was a Latin word. <laughs> I always stumble across those, uh, which look lovely, covered with white, puffy blooms. In practice, these plants are the bane of the Arctic hiker, creating wobbly, ankle-spraining mounds that are separated just far enough to make hopping from one to the other almost impossible. But compared to the trials of the Mackenzie Delta, even tussocks seem pleasant today. We move slowly, stopping to watch a Jaeger flash its long forked tail or a jar of falcon float overhead. Each time, Pat's careful eye picks out a detail that I had missed. Wow, look at those feet. The color of its eyes is amazing. They fly like they're swimming underwater. Sharing observations is one of the gifts of traveling as a pair. Together we see much more than I ever would alone. I lift my binoculars to scan for more birds and notice a dark shape parked near the coast. In the, lo in the low angle sun, I am not certain what I'm seeing, but then the hump moves. It takes only a second more for me to recognize that it's a large grizzly pawing at something on the ground, fur rippling like wind on water. I lower the binoculars just as the bear lifts its head, and I realize I've been fooled. I'm so habituated to using binoculars to magnify distant objects that when I gaze through glass, my brain tells me that the bear must be far away. Not so this time. The bear is close and big and suddenly running towards us. At the distance between us and the bear... As the distance between us and the bear shrinks, we respond just as we've been trained. Stand tall, wave our arms, and shout. The bear doesn't seem to notice. We're moments away from impact when it stops a dozen yards from us, rises on its hind legs to sniff the air. I can make out the upturned edges of its nostrils. We stand frozen, arms raised like scarecrows. The bear faces us for several time-arrested seconds. The green grass glows. The breeze is cool against my sun-warmed cheek. The raspy calls of cranes echo from somewhere in the distance. I can feel more than see Pat standing tensely next to me. And then, just as suddenly as the bear charged towards us, it turns, glancing back only once before launching into a full-fledged run across the tundra and out of sight. <laughs> so, and there's more bear encounters in this book. Um, one that actually tries to hunt them. So that wasn't the case with this one. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's such a, a great book. I really enjoyed the whole read. It's just, it's full of action. It's full of um, her thoughts. You know, she's contemplating at this point whether or not she wants to have 
children, what she's going to do after the six months. She has a couple different career aspects. Most of them involve like office work and she just, you know, doesn't want that right now in her life. She just likes to explore and, and be an adventurer. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really a good book. And what I really like about this book is I will probably never do anything like this, so I get to live vicariously through her. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's that's what books do for us, right? Mm -hmm. They they yeah, absolutely us faraway lands and and things that we wouldn't do ourselves, but would love to you know live through other people who have done it. That's a great great way to say. We need books. We need to love books, <laughs> just as we need to love birds. Well, um, <clears throat> okay, we've got about 14 minutes left of our hour, so let's talk about David Lindo for November a little bit. Um, Betsy's going to switch our screen for us. Um, there. Oh, before I forget it, um, I think, Michelle, you and Drina already know this, but through November 9th, um, we can buy Vulture, the private life of an unloved loved bird, um, with a discount uh, from the publisher. And it's a great book. And um, if you know somebody who's always been interested in turkey vultures or um, uh, black vultures, it's a very interesting uh, book about the life of a vulture. And um, <clears throat> I actually have finished my library book, and I am going to um, buy it to put it in my own library. So it's really worth um, worth it. Um, it's wonderful. It um, Katie goes through the life of a pair of turkey vultures. They mate. Um, it appears that they mate for life, and um, they go different places. Uh, the female bird goes to Colombia. Her male con counterpart goes to Nicaragua, I think. I can't, I, I have trouble um, remembering things like that. And then they go back into Canada uh, in the summer and raise a family. So it's really very interesting. And then there are all these other stories and all of the things that vultures do and what they do for the ecology and why they're a needed part of our ecosystem and uh, they are a federally protected bird and for very good reason. So if you buy the book and read the book, you will learn all these things about why vultures are so important to um, humans um, <clears throat> and the animal kingdom. So um, now, we're going to talk about David Lindo a little bit. David Lindo is the urban birder. He is from United Kingdom, from Britain, from Great Britain. And he now uh, spends time, uh, he lives in Spain as well. Um, <clears throat> and the other day, he came and uh, <clears throat> joined us at Mapping Wonder for an interview uh, with Stor Stormy Schweitzer uh, conducted the interview with David and he shared uh, some very insightful reasons as to why he is the urban birder and why he believed that we can help our environment through the eyes of birds. Um, so David is going to share uh, his book, How to Be an Urban Birder, uh, with us in November um, the 15th. That will be his author interview, and he will also be giving us some tips on how to become an urban birder and um, what you need, which isn't much, um, 
the desire, I suppose, a pair of binoculars and a field guide and a local patch. And I'm sure that David will tell us more about his local patch. Um, he is also um, intending to be with us on November 22nd for our book discussion and share some of his favorite books uh, with us, his nature books. So um, it will be a good session. It's two sessions for $20, and you can buy one of the sessions for $12 um, if, if you would like. And it is on our website, uh, WCAS.org. So um, I usually stop the program with my favorite books. And this, this, this um, time, I thought I would take us through my uh, walk through my favorite field guides. This is a field guide that I have had called the Golden Book of Birds. I have had this, this was my grandmother's book. I don't know if you can see this because, uh, maybe, I don't know. Not real good. I should send it, I should have sent Betsy a slide. But it was my grandmother's and it was the book that always sat beside her chair on the windowsill in her kitchen for years and she would you know look out her uh kitchen window and see a bird and the first thing she would take up was this so i would always run in when i was staying with them and say grandma grandma i need the bird book i need the bird book so i was lucky enough that this this was mine uh when she passed away so it is I'm 70, so she, and she passed away in 1971, so it's a pretty old book. Well, then uh, friends Rosemary and Tom Romito gave me a field book of the birds in the Cleveland region. So when I came to Cleveland, I got a copy of this book, and this is a, a book, a field guide that was uh, – printed by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History uh, in cooperation with the Kirtland Bird Club. So, and I know that we've heard about the Kirtland Bird Club many times. Um, Joy Kaiser, our first author, um, John Kirtland, a physician in Cleveland that taught at Case Western Reserve, at Western Reserve University, um, started the Kirtland Bird uh, Club. He was one of the uh, four from the medical college that did that. So basically, this one is really great, and the reason I think it is, and the Kirtland Bird Club has more copies of this, and I know they will, they do still sell them, but it tells when they're in town, when they're gone, and when they come back. So it's really kind of, it helps if you think you see, you're you seeing a bird and you think, oh, gee, I don't think it's usually back by this time. Well, you can check this, their charts out, and it will help you with that. So, and then there's my husband. My husband has always thought that I'm smarter than I am, and I never really told him I wasn't. <laughs> but anyway, for, um, well, actually, he didn't get me this one first. He gave me this one. I don't, I'm pretty sure you've all heard of David Sibley, and he writes very detailed field guides, and, and they're very, they're not for beginners, um, I don't think. They're very detailed, but he does give some tips about the different ways that leaves are attached to trees, and uh, the shapes of trees, and the barks. He gives you all the barks. It gives you everything you need to really kind of he even does the seasons with uh, this is not really good. I'm going to stop this. Uh, the seasons of the trees. So it really is very, very helpful. So that was the first book. And then when I got interested in Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, he, he gave me the Sibley Guide to Birds. And Basically, when I'm out sitting at, you know, uh, 
Lake Isaac or somewhere else and I'm, I'm looking at birds, I use one of my little books, but I always come back to make sure that uh, I kind of got the right bird because he gives, I mean, he gives them what they look like when they're juveniles, when they are breeding, when they have non-breeding plumage, and he he'll, he uh, hones in on the type of tail they have, whether it's a flat tail, if it's a, you know, like a pleated tail. He's got all these different uh, helps that he gives you, and he's got, like, I think there's maybe about 10 pages of sparrows. So someday I'm going to take this out on my front porch and watch my sparrows at the feeders. I think I've got some of them down, and I know which ones they are. I know I have, like, about four or five species, and I'm going to take my book out there, and I'm going to um, – kind of tear it all apart and see if I see if I was right at all. <laughs> but um, anyway, if you do have people who are naturalists, if they if they enjoy nature and they kind of delve into it in a way that um, is a learning experience instead of instead of uh, I don't want to say only enjoying because I think that enjoying uh, Nature is a wonderful learning experience in and of itself, but if they wanted to like dig a little deeper, it might be a really nice holiday gift, or you can always uh, put it on your wish list for Christmas for yourself or a holiday list. So uh, we've got about three minutes. Um, I want to thank Katie again for coming and being with us. That was very, very thoughtful of you, and we really appreciate it. And it's, uh, we, we hope to see more of you. I know that uh, Betsy and you have a few more things in the works. Um, I know that we are uh, scheduled in um, March, I believe it is, or May. I'm not sure. Um, it's an M month. Uh, to hear about your Cerulean Warbler book, and that, that'll be another one that will be really interesting, I'm sure, uh, given your talent for writing. Um, so that'll be great. And another little tidbit from David, he may be giving us a little preview of a book that he has um, started about um, – Birds on My Mind, and it's more of a book of photographs with small uh, stories about each bird and where he saw them and if it's, you know, if it, at the time it was a life bird or if it's a, a simply a favorite bird that he has seen again and again. So I think that might be kind of interesting if he's ready for that. If he's not, um, he is planning to, since we can't do a visit face-to-face uh, -face with him, he is planning to do, uh, oh, Betsy has put the uh, cover of the puffins, um, the photo of the puffins and the cover of David's book uh, in the chat. And um, he is going to certainly share more of that with us in February or March when he will be doing a um, kind of five-week series of programs uh, with us uh, if, if his schedule allows and if we are able to do that as well. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Any last thank thoughts? You. Drina? Uh, Any thank you, everybody. Thoughts? I enjoyed it. Thanks. I enjoy this. I enjoy this night too. Uh, Michelle? No, nothing, nothing for me. For me. Thank, you. Thank you. Nothing for you. Okay, thanks. And Katie, are you still with us? Yep. yep. Thank you thanks. very much for, um, for having me. Good. Good. That's great. Hi, there you are. You weren't up on my screen, I guess. That was what I thought. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Uh, Betsy, anything I forgot? 
Oh, I don't, but thank you. And this has really been wonderful. I feel like I should bring up a book next time. <laughs> I hope you do. I ask you every time. <laughs> I know. That's and then I won't have to try to show. I will try to have show books that everybody can't see. <laughs> next time I will, uh, if it has, if they have photographs, I'll be sure to send you a couple of slides before. So, all right. Well, thank, thank you. you all for coming, and have a good evening. Thank good you. night, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Bye. Bye-bye.